celebrate today the second Sunday of Advent, and our gathering song now is on Jordan's Bank. And let us now stand and begin our liturgy. And welcome to St. Joseph on the Brandywine Church. For this, the celebration of the second Sunday in Advent, we welcome all of you who are here in person in the church and also those who are watching us virtually from afar. My name is Monsignor Joseph Ribman, the pastor here at St. Joseph on the Brandywine in case you are just channel hopping and lined on our mass. Bill Knightley is our lector today. Uh, will be our uh, homilist today. And uh, uh, Michael Marinelli is the organist and cantor. To begin our service as we do always, acknowledging our faults and failings. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the please be with you all. Brothers and sisters, who let us pause now to acknowledge our faults and failings so that we may worthily participate in the holy sacrifice of the Mass.
from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim her that her service is at an end. Her guilt is expiated. Indeed, she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. It's got the batteries in it. A voice cries out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the wasteland, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The rugged land shall be made a plain. The rough country, a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Go up onto a high mountain. Zion, herald of glad tidings, cry out at the top of your voice, Jerusalem, herald of good news. Fear not to cry out and say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here comes he with power, the Lord God, who rules by his strong arm. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he feeds his flock. In his arms, he gathers the lambs, carrying them in his bosom and leading the ewes with care. The word of the Lord. and 
justice look down from heaven. Lord, let us see your kindness and grant us your salvation. Also, the Lord will bestow his bounty and our earth shall yield its increase. Justice will march before him and guide his steps on the way. Lord, let us see your kindness and grant us your salvation. A reading from the second letter of St. Peter. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise as some regard delay, but he is patient with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, and the elements will be dissolved by fire, and the earth and everything done on it will be found out. Since everything is to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be, conducting yourselves in holiness and devotion, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Because of which the heavens will be dissolved in flames and elements melted by fire. But according to his promise, we await new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you await these things, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him. At peace, the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the desert. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John the Baptist appeared in the desert, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People of the whole Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist. He fed on locusts and wild honey, and this is what he proclaimed. One mightier than I is coming after me, 
I am not worthy to stoop and loosen the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. As we continue this Advent season, this weekend we celebrate the second Sunday of Advent. Advent is a time of preparation, a time of preparation for the coming of Christ. We're going to celebrate his first coming come December 25th on Christmas Day. But we do know at one point that Christ will come again. He will come to meet us either at the time of our passing from this life to the next or at the end of time at his second coming. And so... The Advent season, the church, Jesus himself, calls us to be prepared. And so what better way to be prepared for Jesus Christ's coming than to look at and analyze the one who actually prepared his way nearly 2,000 years ago. And the man and the last and greatest of the prophets, the precursor to Jesus Christ, St. John the Baptist. I think if we spend a little bit of time and look at the unique characteristics of St. John the Baptist, you and I, we can find ourselves well prepared for Jesus' coming, just as St. John the Baptist had done in his own life. First, we see John the Baptist in the desert. The first calling for you and me, if we're going to be prepared for Jesus Christ, is we need to find ourselves and we need to place ourselves in moments where we are free of distractions. I don't know if you've ever been to a desert before. Um, I've been blessed to go to several deserts in my life. And when you go out to desert, you know what you find? Absolutely nothing. (laughs) It's quite a barren landscape. There's not much plant life. There's not many animals. There's not many sounds if you go to a remote location. There's a whole lot of quiet. And so John the Baptist places himself in the desert because it's an opportunity for him to get out of the busyness of life to leave the world and its distractions, and to listen, and to look. When there's nothing around, your senses become very attuned to what is being presented to them. And so the first thing that we can do is follow St. John the Baptist by going to the desert in our own lives, or perhaps creating a desert space in our own lives. What are the moments that you and I have where we can put ourselves in a situation of quiet, of freedom from distraction, and in doing so, find ourselves in a place where we can listen and be attentive. Listen and attentive to the voice of God who longs to speak to you and me. And so we might find that in our rooms. We might find that in a study that we might have in a home. We might find that by going out to a park or a quiet place. All of us, if we're going to find God in our life, we need to create desert spaces Moments where we are free of the world, and we have an opportunity to truly come into contact with the Lord. But John the Baptist wasn't just simply in the desert. He just wasn't simply in a quiet space in his moments of preparation. He also had some key characteristics to him. We hear, oddly, that he wore camel's hair. Now, why was he wearing camel's hair? Well, at face value, it would be a sign of asceticism. You know, the fact that he is not emboldening him and enriching him with the things of this world. Rather, he is looking to the lowly. He's looking to the simplicity. He's not being attached to that. But I think there's a great sign and symbol in the camel's hair that you and I need to pay attention to. And that is, what does a camel do? How is it that a camel can survive in a desert? Because in a certain sense, John the Baptist models the camel. A camel is able to travel for weeks without water, without food, through a harsh desert landscape because a camel drinks deeply. When a camel finds an oasis, it drinks deeply of the waters that it has available to it. And so you and I were called to do the same. When we have these moments of prayer in our desert spaces, in our desert places, in Mass today, we're called to drink deeply. And it's by drinking deeply that you and I were able to wade through the world. It's by being energized by our moments of prayer and worship. It's by receiving God's grace, and particularly here at Mass, 
that you and I, we get the wherewithal, the energy, the strength from the Lord to go out into the world and to traverse through the desert and not to get exhausted and not to stumble and not to die. And so when we are given the great opportunity for times of prayer, the calling of St. John the Baptist is to clothe yourself like a camel. Be like a camel when you have the opportunity to pray and drink and drink in deeply of God's graces. St. John the Baptist also featured a leather belt. Now, belts had a practical value to them, particularly in the time of St. John the Baptist and Jesus. They would often have an overcloth, and that cloth, if you didn't tie it down, would wave all over the place. And so what did a belt do? A belt tightened. It tightened your clothing so that it didn't get snagged or torn or get in your way. In a certain sense, a belt does what it does for us today. A belt isn't just a fashion statement. A belt has a practical value. It literally keeps our pants on. It keeps our clothing on ourselves, just as it did for the camel's hair shirt that John the Baptist was wearing. And so you and I, we too are called during this Advent season to put on our belts and to tighten ourselves up, right? That was the calling of St. John the Baptist to the people of Israel, was to repent, repent from your sins. And so Advent is a time where we need to tighten ourselves up morally. We need to look into ourselves and say, what am I getting right and what am I getting wrong? How am I following the Lord and how am I maybe falling short? And what is it that I can do to tighten things up in my own life? To wear a belt so I'm not loosey-goosey all over the place, but I find myself well put together in God's presence. So we can wear belts, and we should wear belts. Advent is a time of doing an examination of conscience, of going back to the sacrament of reconciliation, if we haven't been in a while, and preparing our hearts to receive Jesus by tightening up our moral life, and we tighten up our moral life by getting rid of our sinfulness. Now, St. John the Baptist also featured the eating, eating of locusts, which I think for all of us probably puts a weird face. You know, I don't know if you've ever had to eat insects before, but at least in American culture, they're not part of the staple of our diet. Um, I had some friends from Colombia, and they gave me these ants with these really long abdomens or rear ends, and apparently they were sweet. Um, I don't know how they found them to be sweet. I just found them to be that crunchy, crunchy. So I'm not too keen on eating insects. Now, John the Baptist probably ate locusts. Why? Because that's all that's available in the desert. But what's interesting about locusts and about insects is, is that if we examine other cultures, it's actually part of their diet. If you go to Asia, you go to Africa, you go to South America, they eat insects. And why do they do that? Well, actually, locusts, even though at face value they might seem really weird and they might seem very distasteful and might even get that gag reflex going in us, um, insects are actually very nourishing. They're one of the cleanest and purest forms of protein. And so what was St. John the Baptist doing? He was getting over the fact that insects are disgusting because he knew that by eating the locusts, he would be the stronger for it. And so what do we need to do during this Advent? Well, we need to eat a locust. Now, I don't literally mean eat a bug. I don't literally mean eat an insect. But what I do mean is, what are those things in our life that we don't want to do, but we know that when we do them, we are the better for it? The things like, I don't feel like doing that. Well, you know what? I'll put it off till tomorrow. Or, oh, I wish that just went away. When we say those things in our heads and in our hearts, we have a locust in front of us, and we have an opportunity. If we just simply bite down on the locust and chomp it, we'll actually find by doing the things that we don't like to do that we grow in God's grace and are stronger in his love. And so, like St. John the Baptist, Advent calls us to eat the locust. What is the thing in your life that you don't want to do, but you know when you do it that you're the better for it? That's the thing that we need to chomp down on during this season. And finally, the life of St. John the Baptist isn't just a rigorous one that's penitential. He finally gives us a little bit of relief. For he not only ate locusts, but he also consumed wild honey. He had something sweet in his life. 
And that's what you and I, we're called to do as well as Christians. As much as we're called to be detached to the world, to rigorously do penance, to make sacrifices, at the same time, God wants to bless us because the Lord and Savior of the world has already come and he's already with you and me and he already desires to bless us with his peace, his happiness, his joy, his life, and his presence. And so Advent, like St. John the Baptist found, needs to be featuring moments of sweetness as well. We all need a little bit of honey in our life. And so what is your honey? What is it that you like to do that draws you closer to God and actually doesn't make you feel like it's a forced duty, but is something that you're eager to embrace and gives you happiness of heart? Eat honey during Advent. Find honey during Advent if you haven't found some yet. For me, the spiritual things that are sweet, that make my heart happy, are like going out, taking a walk, and praying the rosary. I always feel God's presence during those moments. It's a sweet moment for me. I love spending time in the quiet in the church and praying before the Blessed Sacrament, before Jesus. That's also a moment of honey, wild honey, that makes my heart happy when I taste it. I love reading about the lives of the saints, about heroic Christian men and women who have given it all up for the Lord and fearlessly and courageously followed him. Those moments are sweet moments for me. They're honey. What is your honey? What is the honey that you have spiritually that feeds your soul? You gotta have it, because if you don't have it, your life and your walk through the desert of this world is going to be one that tires you out and overburdens you. However, if you have sweet moments and you find sweet moments in your life, if you have a little bit of wild honey, you're gonna find that your journey is actually not only a bearable one, but a delightful one. And so today, might we follow that beautiful example of our great preparer for the way of the Lord, St. John the Baptist. Might we find our desert spaces, and in finding our desert spaces, be like a camel and drink deeply of those moments of prayer that we have so that we're strong and we're nourished with the word of the Lord. And then might we tighten up, tighten up our ship, tighten up ourselves, get rid of the sin, and let go and let God in everything that we think, say, and do for him. And then chomp down, do the difficult work. Now that we've girded ourselves and tightened up our belt, bite that locust, do that thing that you don't want to do that you know is going to make you better. But finally, put that cherry on top. Have a little bit of honey in your life. Allow the Lord to be sweet to you and to bless you with his goodness. And I think if we can do that, if we can follow the example of St. John the Baptist, we will be just like him, very well prepared to receive Jesus Christ for whenever he comes.
For our Holy Father and all pastors, that they may be true shepherds of God's flock, and that more vocations to the church be realized in priests, sisters, brothers, and deacons, we pray. For local and national leaders in every country, that they may work for a world at peace, especially in the Holy Land and areas of the world in turmoil, we pray. For those who speak out against injustice and prejudice, that their voices may be heard and heeded, we pray. For those considering a call to the religious life as a priest, sister, brother, or deacon, that the Holy Spirit may guide their zeal for spreading the good news of Jesus Christ through their life's work, we pray. For those, for all those who have been displaced from their homes, that they may find the help to rebuild their lives through the generous spirit of others, we pray. For all the sick, that they may know God's healing presence, we pray. For all the faithful departed, that they may know the joy of union with God, we pray. We pray in thanksgiving for those who prayed for the recovery of Bill Monsevitz, we pray. For all our Advent prayers, we pray in silence. We pray.
brothers, sisters, pray that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. Be pleased, O Lord, with our humble prayers and offerings, and since we have no merits to plead our cause, come, we pray, to our rescue with the protection of your mercy through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just to do in our salvation. <clears throat> Always and everywhere to give you thanks. <clears throat> Lord, only Father almighty and eternal, through Christ our Lord. For he assumed his first coming, the lowliness of human flesh, and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago, and opened for us the way to eternal life. And so, uh, when at last he comes in glory, and majesty, and all at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we only dare to hope. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and the powers of heaven, we sing him of your glory as without end we acclaim. sending down your spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take this for this is my body, which will be given up for you. <clears throat> In the way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, once more giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, For this is the jealous of my blood, the blood of the new and the eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. <clears throat> As we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. And humbly we pray that 
partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Remember, Lord, your church, spread as it is throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Francis, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray. With the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse and patron of this parish, with the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> through him, with him, in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. <clears throat> <clears throat> deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that, by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I give you, my peace I leave you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Graciously grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
behold him who digs. Let us pray. <clears throat> Replenished by the food of spiritual nourishment, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that through our partaking in this mystery, you may teach us to judge wisely the things of earth and hold firm to the things of earth. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We remind you today. Uh, the new dialogues that just came out this week, along with the parish bulletin, which comes out every week. Also, in the bulletin, there's an insert. The annual Christmas concert put on by our parish choir. Next Sunday, uh, December the 13th, and uh, you'll be on our parish internet. So keep that in mind. The choir works very hard in the present situation.